thank you very much indeed uh, for that introduction. Great to see all of you here because when I came earlier, there was no one in the room. Um, and when you're speaking and you come to a room and there's no one in it, not long before you're due to speak, that's slightly unnerving. Um, it's a bit like throwing a party. You know that feeling when you're throwing a party and you tidy your house up and you put your drink out and your food and you get dressed and then you wait and no one comes. And you think, oh my God, no one's going to come to my party. And then the doorbell rings and you realise it's your most socially dysfunctional friend who has arrived first. And so you talk to him for about 20 minutes. And then people do come and then it's all fine. That's what sort of speaking is a bit like. So a friend of mine uh, once went to Canada to give a speech uh, in the winter, at the start of the winter. And when he arrived in this little resort, <clears throat> he flew there in a little twin prop plane. When he arrived in this resort, uh, everything was fine and um, seemed okay. But overnight, uh, this amazing blizzard came in, which stopped all forms of transport. And so there was no cars, buses, no planes arriving. And he got to the conference hall, which was easily as big as this. And uh, he was speaking in the morning. And there was one person in the audience. Uh, and so uh, he thought, crikey, this person has turned up. It's very, very cold. I will give him my presentation. So my friend got to the stage, gave his presentation, PowerPoint, the works. The audience loved it, gave him a standing ovation, stood up, <laughs> clapped. My friend's very pleased, gets down from the stage. The guy in the audience stops him and says, wait a minute, where are you going? And my friend said, I thought I'd go to my room and have a hot shower because, frankly, it's a bit cold. And the guy in the audience says, you can't go now. I'm the next speaker. So it's always very nice uh, to see an audience. Um, and I'm going to echo uh, many of the comments uh, that you've already had, although I think this whole left-hand, right-hand thing is a kind of interesting thing because my dad was left-handed, but he went to a school system that made him write with his right hand. He had the most beautiful handwriting but he never wrote with his real hand. And so it's just also worth bearing in mind that when people switch hands, it can sometimes be the product of enormous violence. Actually, the interesting thing about tennis is that tennis is a mixture of kind of athleticism, three-dimensional geometry, chess, and boxing. I mean, it's absolutely brutal. Um, so, uh, it's an interesting model for what might be uh, the future. So, I've spent my time going around different places. Um, the reason I'm here, I suppose, is um, that I went to a school where there was no motivation. I went to a school where the most interesting thing you could do was not be at school. Um, where actually uh, that f great Ken Robinson story about sitting in a classroom and watching a guy come along mowing the grass and thinking, I'd really like to be the man mowing the grass because mowing the grass is more interesting than sitting here. That was my experience of secondary school. It was an absolute disaster. The secondary school that I went to was like a barely contained open prison with a really demoralized staff trying to keep Hulk in control of 1,500 boys, where I learned nothing other than how to use my pocket money to buy cigarettes so I could smoke at lunchtime. I literally learned nothing. And then two years later, I got a scholarship to Oxford. And it just seemed amazing to me that you could go through a school where there was no interest at all in motivating you or connecting with you or finding your talent. And then two years later, almost by chance, someone does. And that actually our education systems are full of people who want their talents to be found, explored, developed, and actually nothing is happening. 
If you think of our education systems not as social sorting systems, dispatching people like a carousel at a UPS depot to their destinations, but think of education as a talent development and spotting system, then our education systems are disasters. They're absolutely dreadful. So that's one reason why I'm here. But the second reason is that a couple of years, a few years ago, um, I grew slightly tired of hearing myself and hearing other people talk about the amazing example of the Finnish or the Singaporean or the Ontarian or the Victorian education system. And the implicit argument being that if we could just capture what was brilliant about Finland and then distill it for the rest of the world, then everything would be fine. And so I went around the world looking at examples of people who were trying to provide interesting, engaging, successful forms of learning without any of those resources. And so I think it's absolutely vital that whatever agenda we have, it's not just an agenda of um, trying to learn from what appears to be the very best and then spreading it around the world, but finding solutions that work in the places where they have to work and for the people that they're working for. And so if you think about the future, as we're invited to at this conference, there are lots and lots of ways not to think about the future. Uh, one of the things I have to admit I really hate is the idea of 21st century skills. Um, imagine that this was a century ago, and we were tasked at this conference with coming up with 20th century skills. And the car would just about have become more than a niche product. Uh, there would have been no sense of the mass rise of antibiotics or of x-rays. Um, the pill would have been a distant idea. Nazism wouldn't have emerged yet. Communism wasn't, was just on the horizon. Um, all the independence movements and the decolonization of the late 20th century unimaginable. What would we have decided would be the curriculum for the 20th century were we doing it? So there's a real danger of over-specifying what we need to learn based on what we currently think about the future. Be wary of being too precise and prescriptive. So if we think about the kind of world that young people will face and we think about the kinds of organizations and capabilities that would be well suited to that world, and then we think about what kind of learning and schools would produce those kinds of capabilities, where would we start? Well, I would start with some very, very general features of the world. And the first is this, that we live in a world of tightening constraints. Um, in the developed world, it's a world of tightening fiscal constraints but it's also a world where aging will take more resources from society. In the developing world, the constraints are material, not just for the state, but also for consumers and families who live on very low incomes, even if they're getting richer. And of course, climate change and resource demands are going to impose even more constraints. So the fact is that we live in a world of tightening constraints where resources in particular, and particularly very basic things like water, are going to be absolutely critical to the way people live in future. But it's also a world of rising aspirations, arising aspirations and expectations of how people want to live. All around the world, especially amongst young people, there's a growing culture of a desire for self-realization, self-expression, for people to become the authors of their lives, for their lives not to be determined by where they're born. So if you go to India, the big revolution that's sweeping through India is that where you are born doesn't determine necessarily who you will be. That is an enormous change. And that change is happening all around the world. So in a world of tightening constraints, we have also rising aspirations. That is a recipe for frustration. What do we have to address that rising frustration? Well, the biggest thing that we have going in our favor 
are limitless opportunities for collaboration, largely born by new technologies which allow ourselves to organize ourselves in new ways. The cornucopia that we have is that if you look at the amazing supercomputers of the year 2000 that were able to do incredible feats of computation um, to play chess games and to quantify and calculate enormous calculations, those computers, which were roughly speaking the size of a tennis court, are now the size of a PS3. So that phenomena, this abundance of our ability to compute, connect, um, and through software and hardware, um, create new forms of organization and um, collaboration is absolutely essential. The downside of that is that all of that new form of collaboration breeds endemic uncertainty. And what it really breeds is a challenge to established models of organization, education included. And that means that if you're working in any kind of organizational field touched by these forces, you're likely to be caught in a kind of civil war. So the organizations that I advise are by and large large companies and often public sector organizations, and they're by and large caught in a kind of civil war between people who say, yeah, we know that this way of doing things is tired and exhausted and hierarchical and slow moving and out of touch, but it's what we do and we know how to do it. And over here, people saying, no, no, the future looks like this. It's networked, collaborative, creative, participative, but we've no idea how to do it at scale. And many institutions are caught in this kind of tension about where their future lies. The uncertainty of creating new ways of doing things which require entrepreneurship, innovation, and leaps of faith, and a kind of certainty which nevertheless leads to a kind of dead end. So the young people who we are trying to help to shape the future will have to be comfortable with a world of endemic uncertainty in which they'll have to act without knowing the outcome in advance. And the product of that is a world of kind of oxymorons, of constant strange combinations, of a kind of policy framework often in governments which is a kind of centralized decentralization, or within companies, a kind of hierarchical collaboration, where you get mixtures of things which shouldn't really go together. Or let me give you one other example which might connect with the way that you feel you live. It's a kind of life of a kind of frenzied stagnation, where everything is urgent, and you never get away from work because you're always connected through email, through social media, through bleeps, alerts, your electronic diary filling up automatically with meetings. So everything is rushed and busy and urgent, and yet nothing ever seems to change. And that sense that life is in a kind of whirlpool of rapid change but deep stagnation is, I think, going to be a condition of our times because the forces of stagnation in our society are very, very powerful. Forces of stagnation from incumbents, from the fact that we're aging, from the fact that in Europe, certainly, growth is going to be very slow. And on the other hand, waves of technology which bring change, uncertainty, innovation, disruption, so on and so forth. So one of the features of the world that young people will have to cope with is this strange sense that it's both difficult to change and stuck and yet deeply fluid and very, very open. So how would you prepare people, young people, leaving school for that kind of world? What would it be that they would show, have to show that they should know how to do? Well, I just want to focus on six things which I think should be at the core of that, and that they should run through what young people can do the kind of characters they have, but also underpin, I suppose, the exams and the qualifications that they have. 
The first thing is that I think they should know how to do things. They should uh, focus on knowing how to search for knowledge, how to reassemble and reapply it, and how to combine both tacit knowledge, which is implicit and intuitive and skilled, and explicit knowledge, which is formal and theoretical. And crucially, they should be taught and encouraged to develop a critical attitude towards knowledge. The idea that education should, should sort of give up on knowledge because there's so much around us that it's just a question of Googling it is, of course, complete nonsense. The fact that there is so much knowledge available is ever more reason why we need to teach people to learn how to challenge it, question it, test it, prove it, reference it, and then to reuse it and reassemble it to do something useful with it. So I think that learning should be about encouraging young people to really know how to do things, to be able to understand how they know and to show what they know can be used in different kinds of ways. Knowing should be part of learning at its center. The second thing, however, is that I think learning should be about questioning. Actually, most learning at school is about answering. It's about coming up with the answer when you're asked the question. It's not about asking the question. But if you want to live in a world of endemic uncertainty, where you have to make up your answers, then you have to learn how to ask interesting questions. If you want an interesting answer, you have to ask an interesting question. And you have to learn how to open up things by taking a different vantage point. The trouble with education these days is that it's an exercise in coming up with what the examiner thinks should the answer be at the right time when prompted in the right way. It's not about encouraging young people to be able to ask questions in a way that opens up issues to challenge, to debate, where they have to defend their position but also accept the ideas of other people. So learning how to be a good questioner is absolutely vital to the kind of process that Steve Jobs talked about. The question, what could people do with a, a device that you could sweep your hand across and then get an entire music archive at the touch of a single finger, um, the kind of questions that animate Apple and others are part of what makes them so interesting. So being able to learn how to ask interesting questions is absolutely central. To find opportunities where there is no single answer. And one of the hardest things, I remember one of the best places that I went to uh, when I was looking at many of these innovations around the world was the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Cape Town, where they got these brilliant African students who'd come from universities all over Africa. And they were at the very peak of their classes in terms of mathematics. And they basically spent a year trying to get them to see that there was rarely one right answer and that they arrived wanting to know how to get to the right answer so they could get the best grade. And the teachers, their mentors, their tutors, spent a year trying to show them that actually the most interesting thing was to ask questions where no one knew the answer, and you had to make it up, and then there might be many. The third thing, which I think is absolutely essential, is that young people should emerge knowing how to present themselves, to communicate, to articulate, to show, to persuade people. If you want to live in a world where uncertainty abounds and you need to constantly remobilize knowledge around opportunities, you also need to mobilize people, resources, assets, to encourage and persuade them to be part of what you want to do. And that means being able to communicate what you're doing, why you're doing it, why you care about it, why it's important, uh, what you've done to commit to it. And so to present yourself simply through a written exam, a tick box, a multiple, quest, multiple uh, choice question is a miserable way to ask people to present themselves. 
but actually communicating at every stage why it is that you care about what you're doing should be central to education. The fourth thing is that all innovation, in my experience, comes from collaboration. Um, it very rarely comes from special individuals. It almost invariably comes from people who share ideas and insights, who debate ideas, who um, test them out together, who take risks together, and who combine their ideas to create new ideas. And so if you want an education which is designed to encourage people to act and learn and uh, work together in the face of uncertainty, it needs to have collaboration at its heart. Innovation, in my experience, comes from creative communities which share a sense of cause. What Steve Jobs did with Apple was create a sort of incredibly powerful, almost monk-like com commercial community with a kind of cause to make these amazing products. An education, going to school, should be an experience like that. It should be an education in self-governance. The, the most articulate proponent of that idea that I've met is this woman, Vicky Colbert, who created Escuela Nueva in Colombia, which has spread throughout Latin America and beyond. And Vicky's approach to education as self-governance is both deeply practical. The more you get young people to collaborate, the easier it is for teachers to be able to organize large classes, and deeply ethical, which is actually we need young people to learn how to become self-governing citizens in a situation where they can rarely trust politicians in the state and where many of the solutions are going to be in their own hands. And so learning to be self-governing, to recognize the contributions of others, to work with them, to see how you fit into other people's efforts is absolutely central. It's also central to places like High Tech High in San Diego where much of the work is done through project teams, setting their own goals, finding ways to work together, showing and communicating what they do through exhibitions uh, and uh, public um, uh, shows of their work. So this sense that actually the core of education should be an experience of creative self-governance is absolutely central. Two last things. I think you should go to school to make things. I think that learning should be a process of making not just of answering, writing, analyzing, um, and completing your exams. It should be a place where you go to make things. It might be to make a film, make music, make a drama, make a product, create a business, earn a living even. But it should be something that you do which is productive and you feel is productive and that you produce something as a result that you can show to others and which may have an impact on the real world. So learning, I think, should be increasingly about making and in the real world. This is one of the most remarkable proponents of that idea that I came across, Martin Burt, uh, who set up a string of self-financing farm schools um, from this school, which I visited in uh, the middle of Paraguay, where the young people work on a farm, they create real products, yogurt, milk, cheese, pork, they sell them, and they use the money to employ the teachers. And so their education is simultaneously an education in making and learning and earning, as it is an academic education in chemistry, biology, history, and mathematics. So it's a process where you make and learn and earn all at the same time in an institution which is simultaneously a farm and a school. Well, what if you did that for film, or for um, apps, or for games, or for any range of products where children could learn to make and earn as they learn academic and formal skills. And finally, to the issue of grit, persisting is vital. How you stick at it, how you learn how to overcome obstacles, how Getting feedback which helps you improve is not a bad mark, it's actually a step forward. How you reconceive assessment and feedback, not as marking down, 
but as a step to moving forward. How you uh, reframe all that so that young people see learning as something they do to move beyond where they are to a horizon which is some way off. That is all about self-control, persistence, but it's also about skillfully understanding how to set appropriately demanding goals, which is a real skill of coaching, of teaching and learning, which is both about extrinsic rewards, but also the intrinsic pleasures of doing something pleasurable. So if you want people to persist, as Steve Jobs said, then school has to be a place where you go to learn what matters to you, not just what matters to the education system or to your teacher. It has to be a place where you go to find out what your purpose is. So I'll just give you two examples of things that I'm involved in which attempt to address this. The first is this thing called Apps for Good, which we created about four years ago in a community centre in South London with eight young people. And the idea is, how can you engage young people to learn often the most disaffected by devising a programme where they come up with an idea for a socially good app for a mobile phone and you take them through a structured process where they research the app, they design, develop, prototype, test, sell, make, communicate all as a team, over a period of time. So we started with eight people four years ago. This year we've got 27,000 students in the UK. We've got schools in Spain, Portugal, the US, Australia, and across Latin America using our open source program. And it's very, very simple. The core of it is about young people deciding what matters to them and then doing something creative, collaborative, and making together to create those apps. This is the end of that process where we bring the final teams together in a kind of celebration of their apps. And so, um, you know, there are kids as young as 10 here who are making apps. There are kids here, I'll kid you not, who are ready to work, who could go out at the age of 14 and start working for a major software house. There are kids at the age of 14 who are coming with apps they've made just on their own using forms of Java. There are young people in this who are pent up with potential that the education system systematically ignores and overlooks because it doesn't know how to talk to them. And so what makes us special is that as well as connecting with educators who want to do something different and children who want to do something different, we bring in experts and volunteers from companies outside schools for a whole range of people to help and support those teams, along with big corporate sponsors, Google, SAP, the FT, Dell, and others, to create almost like a kind of community of people who are interested in doing education in a different way. If education won't change from within, then young people and others will have to find ways of doing things without and around it. And one of the things that I think will happen in future is that there'll be more projects like this. But the, the final thing I want to, to end on is that we mustn't think in our rush to the future that all the best ideas sound new. Um, one of the dangers is the kind of breeding of false dichotomies in education between progressive and traditional, between the old and the new, between teaching and co-creation. Um, I, I think a lot of these dichotomies are entirely false and extremely unhelpful. And I just want to give you one example, which is learning both through the head, the hand, and the heart. This is the school that my 14-year-old son goes to in North London, Highbury Grove Comprehensive School. Every child who joins Highbury Grove at the age of seven gets a violin, and they become part of the classical music program. Uh, and they spend three years learning music together. And then many of them go on to choose music um, as their, uh, a part of their exams. But the whole culture of the school is infused with music. Music is the thing that holds the school together. A violin is a technology. 
A violin is a technology for learning. Music is a kind of software. These young people have to learn discipline. They have to learn that it's difficult to master the violin. They have to keep coming back. But they also have to learn responsibility, because from the word go, they're in an orchestra. So they have to turn up and practice for the sake of their friends. They have to accept instruction, but they also have to have self-reflection. They have to feel what it feels like to learn the violin, but they also have to be able to read music. And they have to overcome all of their nerves to be able to perform in front of people when they're not sure what they're doing. So they have to be able to perform in public. That, it seems to me, is a kind of complete way to learn. And what if we learn computing or chemistry or maths or any other thing in that kind of complete kind of way? That, it seems to me, is a model for learning for the future. So we don't need just new processes or new technologies. Actually, what learning needs is a new sense of purpose. And what it really needs is to reconnect with young people that learning can really make a difference. Make a difference to them, and through that, enable them to make a difference to their world. Thank you. <laughs>